This is Being Human, here on our cameraman David's houseboat in the west of London. I'm your host, Richard Atherton, Nick Corston, dad and co-founder of Steamco. Welcome. Good morning. What a beautiful morning to be sat in a canal boat. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Lovely. With the swans swimming past. So yeah, very excited to have you on the show. I thought we'd start with, with Steamco. What is it for people and, and how did it start? Gosh, Steamco has been, I think the definition of Steamco is a journey, really, a serendipity fueled journey. Um, I'm, I'm just a dad, uh, as you said, I'm just a dad. Um, my elevator pitch, I've got a master's degree in electronic engineering. I've got a grade AA level design qualification and a big mouth, as I think you're about to find <laughs> out. So and, and for international people, A level, that's what you get at 18 years old. In that's the right, UK it's, a, system, it's yeah. a sort of a qualification that gets you onto the next step of your career journey, which is the degree bit. Um, so. I've got a, I'm aware, I understand technology, I'm creatively aware, and I love selling a good story. And for 20, 30 years, I worked in advertising, marketing, brand innovation, design, um, and then saw a TED Talk, read half a book, and had a, a bit of a career change, and ended up in the world of advertising, a uh, world of education, um, with this thing, as you say, called Steam Care, which is it's basically a non-profit social enterprise that brings communities into primary schools to inspire kids with creativity, in a nutshell. Right. Two elevator pitches in one answer. <laughs> Brilliant. And the reason I wanted to get you on the show, I mean, we're about bringing a deeper conversation to business. And what I often hear from executives in business, leaders in business, is a frustration often with, with people in the organisation um, not coming up with new initiatives, not taking the lead on creative ideas, and, and how do we create more um, innovation within our organisations. And of course, part of that is the culture of that business. But part of that must be looking upstream as to what happened in people's development and their education before they landed in this business that may shape you know, who, who they are in business. So I'm you know, fascinated and very passionate about this topic and, and a father myself. So, and that, yeah, so take us back to the moment where it all started for you. Well, well that's very interesting. Yeah, so the TED Talk I watched was about, was by a bloke called Ken. And I, and I, I love saying this to business people particularly. Have you heard of Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson? You often get his blank look. Um, have you heard of the TED Talks? Of course I've heard of the <laughs> TED Talks. How dare you imply I may not have heard of the TED Talks? Well, no disrespect, but Ken's TED Talk is the number one TED Talk, 300 million people. So suddenly they feel they've gone from there to there. They've got to be very careful with the psychology. Um, and, and of course the TED Talks aren't the sort of thing you go in and see what's number one this week. I mean, it's Google takes you to the one that, that you searched for, that you're interested in. But, but Sir Ken Robinson's TED Talk about how schools can teach creativity out of children is the number one TED Talk. And I saw that and I thought, blimey, I've got two boys in primary school, four and six, I think they were at the time. There's no way over my dead body they're teaching creativity out of my boys in the state system. Um, and then I ended up going to uh, a festival, Camp Festival, which you've got all this to come. Um, Camp Festival is, is kind of like Glastonbury for, for middle class liberal Garden readers like myself and yourself, possibly, without wishing to typecast you, Richard. Um, and it's an incredible experience. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful music festival cura and an arts festival curated by a chap called um, Rob DeBank and his wife Josie in, in a castle in Dorset. And, and in one end area of this festival, they had a, a thing called the House of Fairy Tales, which is, which is basically a bunch of artists and amazingly creative people running activities for young people. So, for example, you buy a passport for five pounds, they had loads of activities. One of the activities might be go and find some rubbish, take it into this tent and tell us what that piece of rubbish is. So kids were saying, piece of foam, it's an ounce trampoline. Oh, wow. Yeah, so yeah. incredible creativity. And, and as I said, it was run by Gavin Turk and Deborah Curtis, his wife, who's a young British artist, along, along with Damien Hurst and Tracy Emin, the sort of the, the three young British artists at the time. And we went to them and said, this is incredible. We'd love to take this into our kids' school and recreate this experience, this festival creativity in our kids' primary just down the canal here, funny enough, in Paddington at St Saviour's. And um, can we call it the Little House of Fairy Tales? So Ted, TEDx, House of Fairy Tales. Look. And they said, yeah, fine, great. So I went to headmistress and, and she just said yes. And, and The Guardian wrote an article about me, funny enough, and the headline was, I just talk quickly till people say yes. <laughs> okay. I don't know if that's what got me here. I don't, know, <laughs> I bet, don't think I've bullied you quite that much. And the head teacher said yes. And about three months later, we went back and said, well, it's next week, Miss Woodford, what is? I said, well, our, our creativity day, our little house of fairy tales day. And she said, well, well blimey, I, I, 
what, what have I committed to? I said, we've got a ton of clay coming in. We've got 60 parents you may have not seen before, because some of them don't ever want to go to school again, but we've convinced them to come and make some rockets, and we've got 30 raspberry pies turning up, and we ran this creativity thing. And, and the, raspberry pies is not as in a edible pie, raspberry pie. No, raspberry pie, pie little, little microcomputer thing for 20 pounds that kids can learn to code, and in this case, code to make a Lego robot crocodile bite their finger. In one day, 250 kids were taught to code a Raspberry Pi to make a Lego robot bite the finger. One of 20 activities. So that went quite well. We did that for, for a few years, and then we renamed it as Scheme Co. Scheme being this big acronym that's sort of coming down the line. And, and the rest is history, really. So a few years, um, few years ago, I thought, hang on, I, I was background in advertising, marketing, media, and thought I fancy a bit of a change. Why don't I take a few years out and try and roll this out across the country? So I spent the last two years doing exactly that. I've just, I've just spent 12 weeks on the road traveling between Cornwall and Northumbria, Stoke-on-Trent and, and Leeds with the Summer of Love Art Tour. <laughs> Basically, I'm just going to schools, firing rockets, um, running steam co days, fly posting streets with I Love Art posters. So yeah, it's, I think Journey probably best sums it up. <laughs> and have there been any moments? Or, so, so when's the transition point from you putting on this, this activity in your school, the little house of... Um, little, house of, fairy tales, little yeah. house of fairy tales in your school, and then, okay, I'm going to quit my, I'm going to quit my career. I'm going to do this full time. You know, what was the pivot point when you decided, okay, I've really got to do something here. I've really got to commit. Well, prior to that point, I'd spent a lot of time starting, running, selling digital agencies. Nothing massive, small stuff. I was usually quite glad to get out with my shirt on my back, to be honest, with a couple of bubbles, of boom and bust bubbles behind me. Um, and and I ended up working in big advertising agencies, big digital agencies. And um, I lost my job a couple of times, um, sales were down, I was quite an expensive head in the business and they could sort of get rid of me and keep three or four junior or mid-tier people on. And I lost my job once or twice and got redundancy, big fat payoffs, and I thought, you know what, I don't, I don't think I really want to do something my heart's not in, when my heart could be in this. Because I was, I was brought up on, I'm basically a Blue Peter Radio 1 roadshow child, so brought up on maker television and out, out, outdoor concerts and roadshows. And I thought, hey, w w my future could be bringing this experience to schools and, and having a, a damn good time along the way. So, that, yeah, so I think it was that, that transition, really. Enough of that. There's a lovely phrase, which I'm sure you and most of your viewers have heard and got the T-shirt. Um, we all have two lives. The second one starts when we realise we only have one. Confucius. <laughs> I like Classic. that. You haven't heard that one before? No, no, oh, right, I love okay. that. Okay. I thought you might have heard all those. <laughs> I'll use that one again. No, okay. All right. So you, you had a bit of money in the bank. You This really felt like it was something you could put your heart into. Uh, and so you, you took that one experience in that one school and then thought, okay, let's... Well, let's and the other more. thing as well, if, if you go back to my elevator pitch, tech, creative and selling, there is no better story to sell, in my humble opinion, than creativity. And, and then creativity full stop. Subset creativity and its power to engage young people, children in their education and in life, to power the economy, which a lot of your viewers will be very keen on, how do mm. we use creativity to innovate our businesses, and to provide creative jobs. The creative industries is the fastest growing sector here in the UK, and if not in some other sectors in the world. And in fact, countries like Singapore, Korea, these countries are now playing catch up on these things. And also the power of creativity to connect community. I mean, we're, we're filming this in a part of London, uh, Brent, which is a part of a challenged inner city part of Brent, which in two years is London's culture borough, which means they'll be investing millions of pounds in using art and culture to connect the community. Mm. And in fact, there's a school just over the road there, Alperton Community uh, School, where uh, a lady called Andrea Zafaraku just won a prize, a global teacher prize for being the world's best teacher, which even she... Um, finds rather embarrassing, I think, a label, but she, she's been judged the world's best teacher and won a million dollars. And her subject is art. And how art and culture in that school has brought that society, that community of children and their, and their school community together. So c creativity is an incredibly powerful force, yet sometimes a dirty word. I don't know. Well, that's right. And we were saying this before we came on air, that sometimes that, that creative label, especially in business, it's, they consider all oh, that, you know, they're the the sort of slightly flaky ones or you know or a bit creative a bit a bit unreliable maybe or uh yeah you're right it sometimes has this this baggage so it, if you're not obviously in a creative industry you know per se then it can have this slightly negative connotation right 
Well, yeah, the word creativity, I mean, it, it's an interesting word. I, I'm, I'm fascinated to hear you say it has that context in business. I mean, my background, advertising, marketing, innovation, it was, that, it was creativity that fueled those businesses. Exactly. And funnily enough, which the big business is bought into, but quite often only through one conduit point, maybe the CMO, the marketing director, who was often labelled as being a bit outcast, but we need one of them to help sell some it's of these products. Works. It's like one uh, of them is okay. Exactly. A few of them. And, and in fact, marketing director, the average tenure of a marketing director in a, in a blue chip organisation is about 18 months. You know, it's a high risk business. But the good ones get snapped up because most companies need 18 months of injection of creativity and then, then they find somebody else to blame for their sales figures. But, but creativity in, in, in education is a remarkably dirty word in many cases as well. And I, I find this absolutely fascinating and flabbergasting, given that creativity has fueled my career and, and fueled the country. Um, I mentioned Sir Ken Robinson. Now, I was proud to say that Sir Ken Robinson inspired, jointly inspired, this part of the journey. I said I also read half a book, which was a book called What's the Point of School? by a chap called Professor Guy Claxton, who's been incredibly generous to us. And in that book, he said, well, the education system we have is fit for the purpose for which it was designed. It's just the purpose has changed because we don't need children to sit still in factories and offices anymore as we did when the system was designed to roll out the, the British Empire in this case or to, to roll out the industrial system. We need children who can think, be innovative, be creative, collaborative, 21st century skills, all that sort of stuff. So I thought, right, pinning my flag to Ken Robinson would be quite a good move, you know, because people think, brilliant, yeah, we like him, so we like, we like whatever Nick's selling us. Until I saw an article about a week, actually, before, but a week or two before we were running an event in Liverpool that Sir Ken was, was speaking at for us. And the Times Education Supplement, which is the Bible of teachers, ran an article by a chap um, who's a government behaviour czar, he kind of works on behalf of the government, he's a freelance chap, who is their behaviour specialist, who ironically was failed by Westminster Council for running nightclubs and deemed unfit to hold a, a public entertainment licence, yet is the government behaviour czar, but that's another one. And this guy wrote an article saying, I've read Ken Robinson's book, don't bother reading it, it's a load of rubbish. Sir Ken Robinson, no, he doesn't even say Sir Ken Robinson, he said Ken Robinson is a butcher given a ticker tape parade by the National Union of Pigs. Right. Now, basically, what he's saying is that this guy knows nothing about education, nothing about schools, and he's, he's, he's trying to shake things up and, and rock the boat of education where no teachers should be subscribing to that. And I was quite, one, I'm a bit old-fashioned. As far as I'm concerned, anybody that the Queen, bless her, knights and makes a sir, you show a bit of respect, even if you don't agree with all their politics, you show a little bit of dog cap tucked fall up to them. And, 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 and how, dare you, how dare you say that anybody who likes... Ken Robinson and his work and is partially inspired by it, is a member of the National Union of Pigs. Another, another teacher, I wouldn't say respected necessarily, but widely followed and very influential and outspoken on Twitter and on social media, had a, an avatar on his Twitter profile with a picture of somebody with glasses and said, creativity is for people with glasses who lie. Okay. <laughs> so I picked up on this and so he instantly blocked me. And the other chap who, um, who called Ken Robinson a butcher now blocks me because I've, I've sort of picked them up on this. Not rudely, but just, come on, guys, this is outrageous. You know, at least defend your position or debate it openly. So, so, that's, so, so the point is that creativity is almost toxic to some people in education. And there's actually a whole agenda that is trying to perpetrate the, the toxicity of creativity in education, which I, I really struggle with. And as soon as you start going there... You get these accusations of tin hat conspiracy theory stuff, you know, which is enough to shut most people up. I find it quite flattering, personally. I'd love to have a tin hat. But, yes, it's, I mean, what, what's your response well, to that? Well, yeah, I mean, no, it's, it's I, you know, and I hadn't... It was interesting in the notes before this interview, you told me about this, this, this trend or uh, phenomenon of people calling this toxic, the Ken Robertson me message toxic. And I was thinking, yeah, that, that's fascinating to me. What could possibly be toxic about his message? And... I don't know. It must be some. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it must be some form of threat to a, a lot of people within the educational establishment. And it, I mean, is it seen as a critique, and therefore they just it's just reactionary? We don't want to be criticised. Well, it, 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 you then start veering rather close to cons what a position as conspiracy theory is. I, I, there's a lovely bit in Russell Brand's book, Revolution, where he says that we've been virtually conditioned to not say the word conspiracy without tacking theory on the back end, which instantly discredits what you're about to say, doesn't right. it? So, 
but yeah, there are people who feel that the whole education system is designed to brainwash people, to sit still in factories and offices or whatever, or to just dumb them down to not question the status quo. All these kind of perspectives and theories. Do we really want people to be too creative? I, there's an agenda around at the moment. In Britain, we have, an, we have an economic policy with the current government around austerity. So not spending an awful lot of money, strangling the, the economic circular flow of, of, of investment and money in public spending. And if, if you accept that the only purpose of education is to educate people for a workforce, does it make sense to educate them for jobs that aren't going to exist? Because AI and robots are going to take a lot of the jobs. So why waste money, austerity pennies, teaching kids to do jobs that aren't going to exist? And then it starts to become a little bit more class warish. And I don't really want to sort of be, be labelled in that way at all. But arts and creativity are celebrated in the independent sector and in private schools that we work in. We have a great relationship with the private sector. And I've got an article in this Independent Schools Association magazine at the moment about how they celebrate creativity. And as, as Jeff Barton, the school teachers, the school head teachers union leader, has said, Creativity and the arts are not at risk in private schools and independent schools because it's what the parents pay for. Well, I, my children are in the state system. I pay my tax. It's what I pay for as well. So I would quite like it in my kids' school. Yet, trends are at the moment are that because of a number of factors, um, one is, is education policy, which actually discourages people from studying the art subjects because the focus on the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and maths, massive focus on English and, li and literacy and numeracy, and who's, we're not going to argue with that. But you're discouraged from taking art subjects, and therefore, because schools are measured on these other subjects, they're not being taught or, or prioritised in the same way, head teachers, jobs, mortgages, livelihoods depend on hitting these KPIs, therefore they don't teach them. So as a result, the number of art, design, technology, GCSEs are plummeting, Therefore, because children and young people aren't taking And, and for those internationally, GCSEs, that's is, the, is, the certificate yeah, you would take sure, at 16 years old. Yeah. Yeah. So because the, the, the kids aren't taking these subjects, because the schools aren't offering them or aren't prioritising them, people aren't trained to teach them. So you now have this downward spiral. And, and another reason that these subjects are not being selected, it's not just these, these measures. In England, they're called the EBAC and Progress 8 measures. But... I actually believe that a lot of parents don't believe these are valid career pathways. You know, if you said to your parents when you were doing your, your um, subject selection at school, like, yeah, I want to be an innovation consultant, I'm going to play with Lego, with, with marketing, with C-suite teams, you've probably got sent to your bedroom for, for the rest of the evening. Yeah, yeah, you do that in corporate boardrooms, and you've done it with us in schools, you know, with hopefully yeah, yeah. equally successful results. So there's a massive job to be done educating the parents. I was at a uh, a conference the other week, Mira Sal, the, the very famous British actress, um, an Asian lady, said that when she went to her uncle saying what she wanted to be when she grew up and her career pathways and the choices she wanted to make with her school subjects, I want to be an actor. And her uncle turned to her and said, isn't that spelled D-O-C-T-O-R? Yeah, so, yeah. so we have to educate parents. And we have to educate many teachers because a lot of teachers, brilliant people working incredibly hard, but many haven't worked in the world of business, innovation, advertising, creative industry. So they aren't <laughs> aware of these career pathways. And in fact, like many parents, I suspect they may be encouraging children to take subject choices, to pursue career pathways that are inappropriate we're in, the, in the face of the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence and robots. AI robots are not just going to take the car driving jobs or the car making jobs, the robots and the, the Uber type stuff and the self-autonomous vehicles, they're also going to take a lot of those classic middle class jobs. The accountancy jobs are going to online accounting systems like Xero now and that when they start putting AI on top of that they'll probably be able to scan my receipt before I've even got it out of the, out of the, off the till. Um, so accountancy, medical jobs, a lot of jobs exist because they're about the dissemination of knowledge. Well, that exists in the cloud now. It's the skills you require to deliver that knowledge and apply it that's much more critical. Yet in schools, we have a knowledge versus skill debate. A lot of people who perpetrate this creativity is toxic, Ken Robinson, are passionate about a binary view of education which is obsessed with knowledge, so facts and figures, well, who says which facts and figures are the ones you need to learn? Because there's, there's only a finite amount of what you can learn. 
And there is, there is cognitive science quoted that says just the process of learning facts and figures works your brain. So that, you know, nobody's going to argue with that. And nobody's going to say we don't need knowledge. But what we don't need is this binary education view that flips between knowledge or skills. So the concept of project learning, where you actually run a project across a week, across a month, across a day, across a term. I know a school in South London in Greenwich where the whole year, in one of the most challenged communities, the whole curriculum is structured around an episode of The Apprentice. I think that's a global, global name to yeah, really show you. Yeah. Um, where at the start of the year, they get a brief, and they through the year, they do the research, they do the development, they design and make a product, they market it, they do market research, they rent the local cinema to present their work, and they do the refreshments, they do the money. So they're actually having a whole curriculum in a year. Now, there are people that would say, that is absolute nonsense, children shouldn't be doing that. They should be sitting in a de in, at a desk, listening to a, head, a teacher. And yet what you've just described is exactly how people work, in, and certainly in... in in the knowledge workplace, the knowledge economy, right? This, this is, people tend to form into teams, they tend to work based on projects, um, they t they, there are creative en elements, there are marketing concerns, there's budget concerns, there's a whole, so all of those things that get wrapped up in a project like the like of which you've just described is entirely analogous with the workplace. It's and the yet, way the world works. And uh, with the exception of some jobs, right? So it's true that there are some jobs which are desk bound and fairly solitary and Pretty procedural, but as you say, they're the, they're the ones that are likely to get m more automated more. Well, and let's also be quite clear that there are also jobs that involve picking potatoes and and butchering cows or whatever. You know, there are some yeah. jobs where that you, you're not working well. Team skills are possibly just as appropriate there. So it, it brings us back to that argument: Why have a fancy education system where you teach all these sexy 21st century skills of collaboration, communication, and connection, when in fact we do need people to be prepared to do rubbish work? You know, we need to possibly, some people think that we re need to re-educate a lot of people in this country to pick potatoes with Brexit coming down the line. Right. It's, uh, and so it, for those who are not yeah, aware of the politics with Brexit, it may mean we have less immigration yeah, from less across immigration. Europe so and for some, some of these of the, jobs we have yeah, to do so with our own people within the UK. So, so that brings us back to that, what is the point of school? Is school about educating a workforce for jobs? Well, if there aren't going to be many jobs, do we need to educate people to be great citizens? And can we spare arts and culture and creative education on people that won't necessarily need it directly in their employment? But will that creativity add value to society and to communities and possibly to businesses? I mean, we've all read business books about how car manufacturing plants have suggestion boxes. And it's often the one idea that somebody popped in the suggestion box that saved $100 million in procurement down the supply chain because that guy on the shop floor saw the challenge, saw the issue, and had the idea. You know, so it, you know, creativity has a place all the way across the board, really. So bottom line, shouldn't be, even though it is a dirty word. <laughs> right, and interesting how it's... So th th there's something interesting going on here that it, seemingly the, the private schools have a different view of what is going to equip that pu pupil to succeed at, versus the state system and how they've got different views. I it certainly is, seems is, to be the case. A question. There are a lot of state schools that do incredible work. And as I say, the, the school head teachers union, Jeff, uh, leader Jeff Barton, advocates for art and creativity. And, and it's been proven. I mean, just on the BBC this morning, BBC News this morning, there's a film from a school in Bradford, which is an incredibly challenged part of northern England, very challenged inner city area. That a school was failing six years ago, absolutely failing, terrible behaviour, terrible academic results. The school was in a terrible state. And they've invested massively in music education, and it's turned that school around, absolutely turned that school around. Behaviour's up, academic achievement's up. It's in the top 2% in this country now for maths and literacy results. Uh, including the private schools? Uh, I, I don't know if yeah, that's... Yeah, I, right. I, that's a very good point, actually. 2% of... I don't know if it's private or... I mean, the independent sector is quite small, so it would make a massive yeah. difference. I mean, OK, top 3% yep. of all schools, whatever. But, you yeah. know, it's... it's um, it's quite remarkable. So it, it begs the question, so why don't we want this for everybody? And this is where I feel quite naive. Coming into this as a dad, okay, with a professional career behind me, but I'm not an academic expert. I'm not an expert on sociology and, and how education is used as a political football or why or, or the objectives. And I don't know if that's, that's not necessarily the subject to this, but it's fascinating why we sit here now yeah. thinking everybody should be creative. Well, we don't actually want everybody to be creative because there aren't going to be that many jobs. So what's the purpose of it? What's the point, really? Right. But it seems to me that to the <laughs> for as long as we're not 
in a world of AI. And as long as we still have humans doing work, it seems to me that the workplace is transforming into a place where there is more of a need for creativity and innovation and for project-based work is certainly um, true. And certainly in the entrepreneurial space, you want people to work as, as teams and connect with each other and follow their creative visions and so on. So it's more intuitively to me, it seems that there ought to be that kind of investment in Well, and I'd also argue that, in the education that any responsible business wants to be operating in a society that is functional that is not in complete kind of riot banged lockdown because society's fallen apart because that's not the best environment in which to sell products. Mm. So they have a vested interest, as many organisations do in, in their contribution to, the, to society, and hence this, this creativity in, in education, in work and in society. Yeah. And, and we've got organisations working with us for those three very reasons. They, 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 they want to... They see that associating with a, with a social enterprise that's advocating for creativity and inspiring it and, and actioning it, they see that doing that can align with their brand. So if they're a creative business, that's a big tick because, because of the association. It also can fit with them from a, a corporate social responsibility perspective as well. So education, family, community. We're about bringing communities into schools, businesses, as well as parents. So that's ticking a big CSR box because they're doing their bit for society and it, it looks good for them when they come for grants or government paybacks, whatever. And also it's a fantastic employee engagement vehicle as well. So you, you've been on our Steam Co days. I mean, I, 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 still, I love watching that film with you. So I think you're more excited playing with a Lego than those kids were, it was, <laughs> weren't you? Well, it's a lot of fun. And the, the exercise I did with them was like model out your perfect school. And some, and just just that exercise and having them play with the Lego, just the, the the quality of the ideas coming up from that session was just extraordinary. And they wanted jungle gyms in the in the in the, the playground, and they wanted a zoo, and they wanted to redesign the toilets. One a couple of girls wanted to. It was just fascinating to me how much content was there in terms of what this school could be. Uh, but, but what was fascinating about that for me, see, was that that would not have happened if you hadn't given up a day of your time and come in with us and using, if you like, our engagement framework and work with those young people. Because with respect to the teachers, they haven't got that design thinking training and approach. And you structured a workshop for those children that had clear objectives and outcomes. But imagine if there were hooks for that to go back into the curriculum. So they said, well, you all designed a school. So what does the school need to consist of? Let's look at the, the, the utilities, the services, the planning requirements, the costs, the environmental impact of the school that you've designed. There's a whole project for the rest of the term kicked off by just one day from you. Well, that was it, and that was what was slightly, uh, uh, yeah, I suppose what I took away from it was a slight frustration was, you know, I felt like all of these, we'd exploded all these ideas, and we had some charts on the walls and you know, words and so on, and, and it was all going to be sort of packed away and put back in a box. You know? Back to the but, university yeah, right. tomorrow. Yeah, exactly, and that was what was so sort of slightly terrifying for me was actually experiencing this school with today was how regimented it was, and it felt more like a, certainly in the regime of how people were moved around the building and told to sit and so all the rest of it felt much more like a prison, really, than, than a, a sort of an educational establishment. Now, of course, outside of that regime, I'm sure a lot of great work was being done by the teachers, but just the feel of the place was, was sort of locked down and... And, and highly regimented, and again, not not my experience of the workplace, and certainly because I come from a certain perspective in terms of what the workplace feels like, which is going to be different, I'm sure, from those who've got you know, different jobs, more regimented jobs. But but nonetheless, I thought this is nothing like what a workplace would be like. It's fascinating you say that because I, I used to have similarly hippie kind of views as yourself, Richard. But uh, <laughs> no, it's interesting because. I mean, my, my boys went to a school just down the road and, and it's, it's strict and behaviour's fantastic there. And there have been times when I, I kind of questioned, well, can't they just run wild a little bit more? And you've got to be in a playground. I was in a school playground in North London and I got mobbed by 900 children. And it's quite scary, actually. It really is quite scary. And fortunately, a teacher came running out, blowing a whistle, and they all kind of froze and stood in lines. And they, they, uh, in a school, if you clap... 300 children will respond. It's quite remarkable. And a, a teacher said to me once, children are like dogs and horses. You can train them to do anything, which I thought was a frightening thing to, for a, a school leader to say. But you've got to understand that behaviour, when you are talking about such mass systems, there have to be systems. Yeah, and, yeah, and I'm not criticising them. I know you're not, no. Yeah, but I, and that was a wonderful school that you went into, that we were in that day. It was a very, very creative and... 
um, inspiring school and the leader there is a wonderful lady but it, it's interesting she's operating in, within a system and that's the way the system works and has worked for 100 years since the industrial revolution and that's remarkable the, the school where we started our steam co days in, um, in Paddington St Saviour's we, we were very lucky because the head teacher there uh, Miss Woodford is a great leader and runs a great school and what was lovely about the days we had there, we'd have 20 creative activities across the school, coding, spin painting, rocket making, making paper rockets, playing ukulele, all this sort of stuff. And the children were free to go to whichever activity they, that suited them, which we took for granted. I went into, been to other schools and they said, oh, we couldn't possibly run it like that. We have to have it every hour. There'll be an hour and then it'll change from one activity to another. And I said, well, we've got 20 activities. How's that going to work over a five, four or five hour day? Oh, well, they won't all be able to do anything. So instantly, there'll be some children there who would be dying to make rockets and weren't in the rocket stream and ended up having to play ukulele. And, and, and it's fascinating. And it's not for me to go into school and tell a head teacher how to run their school or how to manage behaviour, but I'll do everything I can to encourage them to give those children the free roaming experience that Miss Woodford gives her children in, down the road here. And, 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 and I find that quite fascinating, actually, this regimentation. Because the kids are so regimented, maybe those 900 children mobbed me because they're so used to being in that regimented system. Suddenly some nutty dads turned up with a trailer full of rockets and they just couldn't contain themselves. You know, it's, it's remarkable, this whole behaviour thing and, and the industrialisation of children and the conveyor belt. I mean, this is, I mean we're getting mm. back into the, the kind of education systems and theory. But, but, but yeah, but, but what also comes to mind there is, I don't know if you're aware, funny enough, of the company Steam. Like the the games manufacturer mm. in the states, right now, they they have a system where if you join them as a company, and this is from what I understand, what I've read about them, I've not been there or, or spoken to anybody who works there, but you you have pretty much free reign to join whichever. Once you're hired, you can go join whichever team you want, right? You sort of feel your way around the organisation, which can be quite anxiety inducing, I think, for mm. some new starters. But once once they're there, they 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 find their way into a team. Um, and that idea of self-selecting into what I'm passionate about and where my interest is and letting my intuition guide my career choices is, is I think, optimising for getting the best out of people creatively because then you're, you're finding a match between their inspiration and where they're being productive. And it sounds like when you open the school up and you say, OK, if you want to do rockets, do rockets. If you want to do math, do math. If you want to code the robot, code the robot. That seems much more conducive to creative results than than something that's much more sort of time bound and regimented and we had a ceo of a digital agency on here and he his his line is he's big on um managing energy not time right so you want to manage the energy of your company of your staff and 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 that be what's important and less about time and task and time i suppose what's well, interesting because there are a lot of children coming out of certainly the british education system if they were put into a job at steam they'd probably end up being shown the HR department and be out by five o'clock because they would not be able to make that choice. I might go into schools making paper rockets with kids. It's one of the things we do as a little, just a half day sampler and the kids get to make a paper rocket like this. Um, Those listening, let's get a paper rocket two sheets out. Of, it, two, yeah. sheets, two sheets of, two <laughs> sheets, <laughs> two <laughs> sheets of, um, edit like that. Shits, um, two sheets of paper and a bit of masking tape made around a pipe. We fire this with 200 PSI. Don't show the kids this, but you can blow it. Or whatever, <laughs> that failed, but well, it's a bit better than that. Um, I've just blown a rocket across the, uh, the houseboat. But the amount of children who come up to me and, is this right? How do I do this? Is this long enough? Is this right? Some kids can't even use scissors. So how are they going to survive in that environment you've just mm. described? The Googles of this world, which provide the most stimulating and exciting and flexible and free work environments, how many, how many children are going to survive in those environments? Well, maybe the children who've been to the independent sector who've had that space, although a lot of independent schools are, are very regimented. A lot of kids, I'm a friend of mine who's just taken his, his son out of a very, very good private school, independent school, because it was becoming an absolute exam factory, a hot housing, and the children are coming out, they're broken. So it's not an independent versus state system approach here, it's the way you approach education. Um, and we, we have to give our kids the confidence to, to make mistakes and to try things and fear of failure. And I, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's interesting where these, where these companies do get these kids from. Mm. And there's a whole generation coming through now who are very, very much used to this instant gratification of gaming, 
and smartphones and apps and flicking through Instagram and you know, trying to get my kids to do their homework or do anything other than play Minecraft or Fortnite is, is a challenge. You know, well, that's a whole other challenge, isn't oh, it? Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah screen time. I mean, yeah, you've got, you've got 18, your 18 yeah. month kids probably aren't on... Yeah, they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're, no, they're not on screens yet, so we yeah. don't have that problem, but yeah. Um, and so the other question I had in my mind here is why are you choosing to try and sort of work with the system as opposed to presumably another op opportunity for you which is just simply to take your kids out of school or oh, person and, and, and you know I'm just that's interesting for me is that you, you seem to have a desire to to try and fight the system or work with it rather than find another way my own children with your own children or well, generally yeah. or just advocating Gosh. sort of dropping you know stepping out of that system entirely so what interested interests me here Nick is why why try and fight the system have you ever considered doing this another way perhaps in the case of you being a dad, homeschooling or perhaps adv advocating for approaches to education outside of the, of the system, so to speak? Gosh, I, I, yeah, fight the system. It's funny, actually, a, a government um, minister's special advisor said, oh, you're a think tank and a lobby group. Right? That hadn't really occurred to me, actually. I was just expressing opinions. Um, so I'm, I'm not here to sort of totally fight and reinvent the system because you know, a one man, one, one organisation can't boil the ocean, but we do want mm. to bring some good into this and raise awareness. In terms of my own context and my own sons, I think if I, if I knew then what I know now, and it's when I meet young families, mm. young parents such as yourself, I, I have a bit of a chat, and they're, they're often quite fascinated. Um, and I rather patronisingly and big-headedly, I'll say, well, you know, think yourself lucky you spoke to me now and not when your kids are eight, which is when I discovered a lot of this stuff because at least that can inform some of your thinking you can be aware of this stuff I, th I think I, I, I would love to have home educated my kids but you know what they're only at school four or five hours a day and and I'm running this project home based at the moment and I have been for a year or so so I personally think this is an education for my sons they, they're bored stiff with it and they groan every time I drag them out at six o'clock in the morning fly posting conferences and printing t-shirts and carrying boxes through the house. But I, I personally think th this is an incredible opportunity for them because I will, I'll be sitting there having breakfast with them in the morning and hear that a thousand school head teachers are marching on Downing Street in London, the Prime Minister's residence, to petition them because of school cuts and funding cuts to schools. And then and there I'll have the idea, I'll tell you what boys, why don't I rent a three-wheel bicycle and cycle down with a load of coffee for those head teachers and a load of Steamco newspapers. I just printed 5,000 newspapers about creativity and, and why we should collaborate for creativity. And there's, there's, a, there's a PR marketing stunt and support for our teachers conceived at breakfast. I hope that my, my boys, they picked up from there, you know, when they went <laughs> to school for their treble religious education and, and, and double maths. Um, so, yeah, that, let's see what happens tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, it, it, it takes all sorts, and, 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 and I, you know, I can't fight the system. I had a handout when I was made redundant a couple of years ago, which got me through a few years. I can't afford to take my kids out of school. I can't afford to put them in a private school. To be honest, if anybody said to me, what would you do if everything was possible, I'd probably find the best school, and it would possibly be an independent school, depend on geography. And, and I may consider that, but it wouldn't mean I was advocating for independent sector if I'm still fighting for the, the rights to access a creative education for everybody else. And I have no truck with anybody who criticises Labour, socialist um, politicians who put their own children into a private school if they think that's the right thing for their kids. Because every parent wants to do the best for their kids. And frankly, it'd be hypocritical if they didn't. But if they're campaigning for a better system for everybody else, and if that system was good, they'd put their kids in it. I... I'm sticking with my, my own experience. My, we, there's a, there was a school down the road here, brand new school building. They spent £97 million building a new school in Holland Park. Bill Gates and Madonna, I believe, have got ha houses at the end of the, the playing fields. £97 million on a school, when most schools cost 20 So they've got an Anthony Gormley sculpture on the roof, infinity swimming pool in the basement, amazing art and design facilities, and we were out of the area, so we weren't in the catchment area for that school but they have 20 places for art aptitude. So kids who've got artistic ability. My son applied for that, one of 950 kids who applied for 20 places. Wow. He got a place. Wow. Within two years, they'd almost seemed to have taught a love of art out of him. They said, oh, actually, we're closing the design and technology department down and dust sheeting it because our head of BT left and we're not going to replace them. 
we're focusing on these academic STEM subjects and there'll be no art for two years while he gets his head down and does his GCSE examinations before he goes off to sixth form. I was horrified. So we, we got in on the creative place and suddenly the opportunities weren't there. And, and I had to take my sons out of that school and then they went to a school that does encourage the arts and creativity and offer a broad and balanced curriculum. Right. So I've done what I could within the system, within my means. Yeah. Um, is that pushy parent? Am I getting things for my kids that other people can't? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the state, the, the public yeah, school yeah. system. But it, it's difficult. And as I say, every parent wants the best for their kids. What, what I have a problem with is when people want the best for their kids and are prepared to stand on the heads and shoulders of others to get it. And it's the sharp elbows, you know. And so it's, it's a difficult balance, you know. And I've, I might get a lot of hate for even advocating for independent schools. I'd rather see everybody. And, and in America, as I understand it, particularly in places like Manhattan, a lot of people have their, their children in the state system. I mean, Seth Godin, who's one of the, one of the most inspiring people on, on this journey for me personally, I, mean, I, I get references that his, his, it sounds if his kids or ch children have been in the state system with other children because they feel that that's the socially responsible thing to do. They're not using their kids as guinea pigs in some failing system. They're making a better system by supporting it. Right, yeah. Okay. I can see how you, you could take that take that view. And I suppose that is often the problem with state schools is that, you know, when they're close by to a good independent school, the sort of drain of the middle class kids or well, yeah. or, or when it's sectored. But yeah. But then I and we could we could probably devote the rest of the podcast to that. But it sounds to me like even this is a message which sort of transcends almost how these schools are funded because it's really about where you orientate yourself, right? Given your budget, is it towards arts and creativity and project-based learning, or is it, um, or is it more regimented and and more focused subject by subject, and, and potentially excluding some of those art subjects? I mean, is that is that correct? Is it how much is it really linked to funding? Well. It, it, Interestingly enough, I'm not, I'm not convinced it is purely a funding thing. Um, when we have an accountability system and the KPIs of schools are based on these core subjects, which aren't arts or creative-based subjects, people are going to gravitate towards those in many cases. Uh, we have this, in England, we have this, this system here called Ofsted who measure and monitor schools for the government and the schools inspectorate system. And... Even they have now come out and said we are concerned about the narrow education curriculum focus in this country. I've worked with a head teacher in a school in Sunderland in the north of England in a very challenged city area and, and very, very challenged um, ex-shipbuilding area who is passionate about art and creativity and says that he gets uplift on all academic subjects by using the art, a bit like that school I mentioned in Rotherham, um, mentioned earlier. And he says that Ofsted are actually quite clear, they value creativity, but it takes brave leadership. And, and, uh, and I find that comment quite interesting because it echoes back to the language of the business world which I was in, the Tom Peters, the leadership stuff, all the sort of stuff that you guys probably work with. And, and it does take a brave leader in any business or in any school to do what they know and their heart tells them is right sometimes and not to kind of cop out to the government metrics and the government systems. Right, well, that, but yeah, and that, but that's fascinating. So it sounds to me like, in some ways, the, the same thing that often kills innovation and creativity in companies is, it, it, well, it's the same thing within schools, and it's this idea of managing and controlling to a set of outcomes as opposed to being guided more by a sense of, of purpose and vision and, and a desire for impact. Right, it seems like it's the it's the same mindset which potentially kills innovation in a school as it might do in a company. It's interesting it? because all businesses, whatever they say, have the same set of KPIs and outcomes. It's it's shareholder value and, and yes, and but there's a different way. There's a different way you're, the relationship to them. I think different yeah. differs. Right, if you've got one business that wants to predict and control down to the penny exactly what's going to be spent where in order to achieve which outcome, versus a company that may monitor some of these, a few key metrics, but is, is much more willing to trust in the creativity of the staff in order to have an impact and be successful, then you're going to get a different, different quality of culture. Well, it's interesting. I, I've spent many years working in one of the world's largest advertising agency groups and creative agency groups. And, and I, I did a, a mini MBA thing in um, 
in uh, Harvard uh, a few years ago. And, and one of the themes that came out from that, that the messages that these creative industry organizations are hammering into their senior management is, don't worry about the numbers. Look after the people, and the numbers will look after themselves. Because they've all got a financial director who's keeping an eye on cash flow yeah. and banks and making the numbers work. And, and I have worked in agencies that were obsessed with the numbers, and it was the spreadsheet driving the business, and it killed the culture, it killed the creativity. Now, if you're making widgets and cranking bits of metals into, into cars, then, in, for example, the Nissan factory in Sunderland, that's what you need to be doing, cranking that out. Ironically, Nissan Europe's design headquarters is down the canal here, here in Paddington in London, where they design the Qashqai car. So they, they celebrate and allow creativity to flourish over there and they don't let those designers are not bogged down with the numbers and finances and profitability of the overall Nissan Corporation. <laughs> they're, um, they're focused on designing great vehicles, whereas somebody else somewhere is, is managing the numbers. And so yeah, it's, they're inextricably linked, but a brave leader shields his team from the engine room, I guess, don't they, in, in, in those businesses? Yeah, yeah. Or, or well, they, well, interestingly enough, I think they may, they may have to, in some cases, in order to, to insulate their people from the potential damaging effects of this, this culture or subculture within a bigger business of, of managerialism. Um, but actually, you, I think there are companies where that brave leader isn't, isn't required because it simply doesn't exist in the culture. Um, yeah. But to the extent that it exists, I think you're right, you do need a, a counterweight, and that is often that singularly talented and committed leader. Um, but, but it doesn't, all, doesn't, doesn't necessarily require it, if the culture's right. And, and that's you know, the, the, the culture of leadership, the culture of creativity, the culture of innovation. These are all fairly inextricably mm. linked, mm. whether it's a car company where creativity is, is limited to a building on the canal in Paddington, and, and nobody's allowed to be creative on these mass industrialized manufacturing plants. But many of those Japanese companies listen to their staff, and, and they do have those suggestion box systems, and some of those insights come out that streamline manufacturing workflow right. or efficiencies in supply chain. So, um, yeah, again, creativity. It wields, it's, uh, it, it, it pops up here and there. All over the yeah. Place. One of the questions I had for you here was just to think about the difference between you having been, you said you're a senior in terms of running creative agencies, and now you're moving into this position where you're, you, you don't have the resources of a large organization, you don't have a, a sort of a team of people committed in a business in the same way as you were before. Have you had to change as a leader, as, as a manager? Has, has there been anything you've had to learn as part of this transition? Interesting being a manager when you're managing a, a team of one at the moment, but no, it's um, deep down I've always been entrepreneurial and self-starting. So I've, I've I've run my own companies and I, well, I started my career at British Telecom BT, so one of the world's largest telecoms businesses. It was a very exciting time for them, and and then went to very small companies and then ran my own for for, for twenty years in the early days of digital media interactive advertising. Um, so, I, and I've, I've been quite flexible and I've had a range of experiences, but I think one of, it, it brings me back to that Blue Peter boy, you know, that maker mentality, really. I love rolling my sleeves up. I mean, and, and technology liberates. I mean, this newspaper I designed, wrote, and pulled back together myself on a laptop, pressed a button, sent it to a printer, and suddenly got literally two tons of newspaper delivered to my door. It's frightening. I mean, it's, it's frightening. You can make a website and it sits in the cloud somewhere. You print 5,000 papers. And, and, and funny enough, I decided to use a slightly better stock for this one because we, we launched this in London's Design Festival. So I went for 70 GSM stock instead of 50 GSM grams per square metre. And I couldn't work out why they were heavier. Well, of course, they're 40% they're heavier because I got better paper. It's, you know, so these are, you know, maybe that's the problem when you have amateurs designing your newspapers. But it's a fascinating journey. And I do love that hands on nature. And I, I also think in any business, and I know a lot of senior management have to compensate for this or simulate it by getting grassroots experience, by working on the shop floor or by going into their stores or meeting their customers or traveling on their, their trains and buses. You know, I'm, I'm building a business model here, a social enterprise model that can scale really, really easily. I am on the road, I am firing rockets, I'm running activities with kids, but if I can do it, anybody can do it. 
and 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 the kind of this is this is a community engagement model. The, the next phase we're looking for, we're looking for some companies and some grants organisations to, to 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 fund phase two of Stephen Co. If you like, we've done the profile raising and built loads of connections. We now need to prove that it's not reliant on me being the nutter driving the van making the rockets. That anybody can do this with some passion, with some training, with the resources. And there are a lot of teachers leaving teaching, design teachers, drama teachers, science teachers, who would possibly be very interested in a vehicle like this, a framework like this, a business like this, almost like a, a social enterprise franchise model. Um, do you give a man fish or do you give him a fishing rod? Well, maybe a Steamco drop truck and, and a bunch of rocket kits is, is that fishing rod to give people that opportunity to go into their communities, to work with schools, to bring businesses together, to evangelize for creativity. So I think when you, when you build something and work on something that you know is gonna be scalable, um, it's very important that you've done it yourself to understand how to package it, to know the lessons. And, and I'd like to think, I, I don't ever want to be driving a desk again. <laughs> you know, I really want to be out there working and making. So, um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's, an ex it's an exciting project. And, and, and I think scalability and sustainability are going to be the measures of phase two. Can we prove it can scale? And can we prove it will be sustainable? Can money come into this? And part of this Collaborate for Creativity campaign we've just launched is to put a call out to schools that would love to have one of our Steam Co. Days, one of our creativity festivals. Just find schools that would like those but maybe can't afford them. And every school's got money. They all get budget, but how they allocate it is, is, is the challenge. Um, and once schools have budgeted, there will not be a penny. So who'd like a Steam Co. Day but who hasn't got any money at the moment? And who would like to do what you did and come in and work on one? Or who would like to come in and actually pay for one and send five or ten of their staff along? So a, a digital agency in Shoreditch in London sent a dozen staff to a very challenged school in North London and, and helped run a Steam Co. Day. It was the best day those, those staff members had, apparently. And there are people in that agency now prepared to take days off on holiday to go and work on those days because they enjoyed it so much. How many companies are out there that would say, actually, we want to be part of this. We'd like to fund it and, and help make it work. So, so th those are the challenges, really. We've got sustainability. I'd like to think that a project like this might be able to justify a little bit of every corporate CSR budget and we have a fund. So schools that want to run a Steam Co. Day but just can't ask their parents for any more money, another pound or two here, and there's a lot of money when people are constantly being asked for, for, for money for bits and pieces, but well, they apply for a grant and we give them half the money if they can fundraise the other half. Or companies just pay for these trucks and these people on the road. So it's that sustainability and, and scalability that are the big challenges now. And they're the challenges for any business, really, aren't they? Right, thinking about the model and, yeah, and how do and, we scale uh, it yeah. up. And, and, yeah. and these tiers of management that then creep in. You know, can you do it completely? Could I literally do it from, from my home office with a laptop? In fact, just running this network. You know, do you need right, a Right, that's very function? lightweight center and it's just some template. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Or virtual teams. You know, virtual, so, yeah. so you've got, you've got field, field management and, and virtual offices, people working from home in Welsh muck valleys or northern coastal towns you know right it'd be lovely to build a network of people working virtually like that right and that's so they're a different set of management questions perhaps than in your previous lives um, that, well yeah. absolutely yeah. so maybe i should be putting a call out now to your viewers to <laughs> if anybody's got any idea on how to scale this please do um do chip in and well i can certainly recommend for people in the uk who want to spend <laughs> a day doing a, a steam day as you say a mini festival i mean it was it was fun. Ordinary. It, it yeah. was a lot of fun. I think we should cut to a commercial break now and play that film in the middle of your uh, podcast, but people have to Google that. Yeah, and just to give a flavour of it, you know, and that, I think th the flavour of the day, we had a, a, a maths academic came in, didn't she? And she was doing some, some artwork that um, linked to a, a particular flavour of mathematics. We had some people from a big bank coming in and helping doing kids coding. coding. Yeah, basketball. You were in the, yeah. the, the, the playground with your rockets. It was... It was brilliant, you know, and I well, think... What was, what was nice from that, if people do check that film, I don't know if you remember the film, but the, the teacher, one of the teachers ran the rocket activity, and again, you could see that he was having a fantastic day because he was off curriculum. So I don't actually go in and run the activity. I tend to facilitate and, and just sort of stick things together if they break and make sure everybody's happy and run around and do an opening assembly. But teachers tell us that these are the best days they have in schools as well. So why would we deny our teachers and our children a fantastic day? You know, there's something in this. <laughs> right, there is. And then 
Yeah, and then the other part of my engagement with you was this re watching this movie, most likely to succeed, right? Which is something you can only see as as a screening. That's not something you can watch online, is it? But um, and that touches on how to organise a school around pr a project-based curriculum, right, or a project-based. Well, that's, that's interesting structure. because that, that school, they remember they they taught. This is a film um, set in America, in in a chain of schools called High Tech High, where they. Over, over the course of the year, they, they make a model of American history. Remember that? So yes, that's right. They have to do the academic research to know what they're communicating. They have to make the motors and the machines to make things move and animate. They have to manage their time. They have to cost it. They have to budget it. They have to play act certain bits. And, and, and that's this project-based learning, which so many people decry. And, and what's interesting about those evenings, we're, we're licensed, if you like, as change makers, which all sounds very grand to host what we call these community screenings of this film, where we show the film, and then four or five people like yourself will come in, so somebody from the world of industry and innovation, such as yourself, some, a head teacher, um, maybe a student, uh, maybe a parent, and they will comment on what they've just seen. And, and not that we're saying, this is right, this is the way to go. Here's a stake in the ground, here's where we are, here's where it could be. What do we feel about that? Or how might we evolve towards that? What questions, what thought starters might we throw in? And I would love to host some of those sessions in companies, actually, um, with their staff. What does this mean for us? Because as you say, we've, we, we need our schools to be teaching our children the skills we're going to need. So I think that might be an interesting, because you, you were on one of those panels, weren't you? As you say. I was not on a panel, but I was in the audience and I watched oh, it and I got, audience, I got yeah. a lot out of it. And I just I think for people listening who are more interested in some of these ideas is, that may be another avenue is if you're in the UK, come and get involved with the Steam Day or just get inspired by the idea and do one in your own school, wherever you are. Or this this screening of this movie, I yeah. think, is a, another option We just have a conversation people. about creativity in your business, in your organisation, because yeah. there are so many perspectives to this, aren't there? Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, and that's another thought, actually, is how do you get inspiration from this in terms of one, one thing a that, company? One thing that really is interesting, when we started the Steam Co thing, we said it's a collaboration of teachers, businesses, creatives, and parents. And then I went up to a school in North of England in Darlington, very challenged area, and the head teacher picked me up in an audience when I asked the question and said, I can't even get four parents cleared to be on my panel of governors with from safeguarding perspectives and child safety and, and uh, criminal record checks and all this sort of stuff. And it, made me realise you know, ch children and schools can't even rely on their parents. And so I had to reframe it as a collaboration of teachers, businesses, creatives and carers. And then instantly, because the word carer is very loaded as people who may be pushing people in wheelchairs or helping the elderly or infirm, I then have to define carers. So carers, asterisk, read at the bottom. Carers are people who care. Gosh, radical thought. So people who care about children, people who care about creativity, people who care about all our futures. Now, those carers might be parents. They might be people who've had kids who've left, empty nesters. And the funny thing about kids is you only get one go, unless you're sort of like a rock star and you get married again at the age of 80 and have another child um, and get a second chance. But what a great opportunity to go back into schools and, and play at being a parent again or, or, or work with young people because it's a fantastic experience. And even now, my boys are, are in their teens. I love working with primary children because they're so innocent, they're so creative, they're so inspiring. It's a great experience. So empty nesters, people who are never going to have kids. I mean, you worked with us before mm. you had started your family. And, and I'm, I'm actually fascinated, coming from the creative industries, I'm fascinated by the young millennials who are in these creative companies, the advertising agencies, the design agencies, the tech businesses, bursting with creativity. And, and I think it's that creativity to a certain extent, that creativity gene in many, many people, if not all of us, that is fueling the Instagram thing. You know, there's taking pictures. Everybody thinks an amazing artist. God, I wish I had my... That is such an amazing photo. Sorry, guys, I've got to cut now because I want to take a photo of that, of that tree. Because people have become photographers and, and they love it and the filters it makes. So I think Steamco is an outlet for that creativity, but for the benefit of children. Because we, we focus particularly on primary school. So children in their, in their early years at school, um, the age, between the age of four and 11, because they're so often overlooked, yet it is critical to sow these seeds at that stage. And also because their teachers are flat out 
teaching them the basics, reading, writing, and, and maths. You heard of the three R's? Mm. Do you know what the three R's are? <laughs> You're going to tell me it's no, something on. different from what no, I think on. it is. Reading, writing, no, go on. and arithmetic. Uh, arithmetic, yeah. So reading, writing, and arithmetic. Or arithmetic, yeah, so there's three R's. There's actually a fourth R. When they were invented, there was a fourth R. So do you know what the fourth R is? Right, go on. It doesn't begin with R. It's rorting. Rorting. Rorting, like the chaps doing out there, banging <laughs> bits of metal. Oh, rorting. Okay. So, so those were considered the four key skills, reading, writing, numeracy, maths, and the ability to make. Making, rorting, rorting metal, iron, wow. blacksmithing. Mm. And we've lost that fourth R. So making things. And, and one, well, I, think one of, I think possibly the second most inspiring video on the internet is Kane's Arcade. Have you seen that one? So that's my gift to you today, the second most inspiring video. So it's, it's basically the story of a young lad in South Central LA. I don't know if he had a mother, because his father only figures, and his father works in an auto parts shop in South Central LA. And it strikes me, in South Central LA, the, the main focus is on surviving, feeding a family, and not getting shot, from what I perceive. So this kid, in the summer holidays, goes and works with his dad, or stays in his dad's car parts place, because it's the only place he's safe, and he builds an amusement arcade out of cardboard boxes. And he's called it Kane's Arcade, and, and for 25 cents you can have a little gift, an all day pass, and you can play any of the games, and, and you put a cardboard slot and his head pops up and tells you a joke, it's wonderful. But nobody came, nobody came to this arcade, because as I say, they've all got their heads down trying not to get shot and feeding their families. Until a trendy film producer from an ad agency somewhere in Hollywood happened to be wandering by and walked in on this and thought, this is incredible, absolutely incredible. So he flash mobbed it, and a thousand people turned up the next morning. <laughs> so they started a foundation um, called the Imagination Foundation, and every year they run a project to get a million kids around the world making stuff out of cardboard. And, and we ended up launching the Cardboard Challenge here in the UK, and we were on BBC Breakfast. But it's quite remarkable the pleasure a child can get from a cardboard box. And one of, our, one of our creative ambassadors, creative inspirator, Tom Morley, who um, used to be a drummer in a, a very popular band in the 80s, Scritti Politi, he, he did a talk for us about the world's most popular toy, which is a stick, and the world's second most popular toy, which is a box, the cardboard box. Forget the toy that came in it. Okay, we don't make much money selling cardboard boxes, but kids usually get more pleasure out of the box and, and making things out of it and ripping it. And, and that's this maker thing that we really need to be bringing back into, into our children's lives for everybody's benefit, really. And that's what we're losing. The rorting. Rorting. And, got, and again, nothing to do with budget. And that's, that's, that's as true in schools, I think, as it is in business. You know, this is about you know, mindset and how you orientate yourself and what you value, right? And Absolutely. But it's easy to forget these things. You know, with, is there an app for that and the latest computer game or interactive experience, you know, which are, are, are mind-blowing amazing. What's not like, why would a child not want to play a computer game? Why would they not want to spend four pounds on their latest add-on that's going to let them kill all the monsters in 10 minutes and go to the top of the league table? You can't argue with that. But the morning after, and, and gosh, okay, so this was about four years ago, we watched the Kane's Arcade film at home. And I, I, everybody should watch this with their kids, not on their own at work. Watch it with your kids. My son, my youngest son, who was a Minecraft computer game, I wouldn't say addict at the time, but he was, he was keen on that stuff. He got up the next morning and was making things out of cardboard boxes in the kitchen at six o'clock in the morning. I mean, it's remarkable. Uh, it's, it's so inspiring. And, uh, and, and I've, I also have this theory that with computer games, if you give a kid a computer game, they play it. Give them a PlayStation, they'll play it. Give them a coding environment and scratch and a few bits, and, and they'll make their own computer game. Okay, they'll soon get bored and go back to the computer game. And I think if I had one wish, it would be from I was going to say more responsible, it sounds a bit preachy, uh, computer games that advocate and develop and c nurture the kind of skills we're talking about here now. So, okay, you could argue that World of War, um, uh, computer games, the big battle computer games, foster team spirit and collaboration, that's, that's fine. But do they always have to involve shooting? Can they not work collaboratively to build a house of cards or to make a cardboard model or something? I don't know. Or even code, give people, kids the opportunity to code up what the shooter might look like. Well, yeah, you can code in Minecraft. It's actually quite hard and you don't bother because you're wasting good shooting time, aren't you? So, yeah, and, and I know Microsoft are doing a lot of work with Minecraft to build educationality and education functionality into there, which, yeah, it, but I, th I mean, even a PlayStation, I mean, we, we bought a PlayStation 4 
the other Christmas, and I was really looking forward to getting a, a, a good old tennis game or something. The four of us could sit on the sofa and play together without wires, because it's all Bluetooth and wireless now. There are hardly any PlayStation games that are multiplayer with the people in the room at the same time. You can play somebody in China or America, or somebody in China and America, but to play your friend or your uncle or your brother or your dad on the same settee is quite hard. It seems remarkable, doesn't it? Mm. And, yeah. and, and, and I'm convinced, even if you gave, if, if you had Pong, that, that old school computer game, on a PlayStation, two kids would play it with each other if they're playing each other. They would feel the need to play something in China. And I think there's, I don't know what the dynamic is. Maybe there's more money to be made with the online gaming subscriptions and blah, I don't know. Well, but yeah, it's probably it's easier to scale, right, presumably, when it's done online. Um, but yeah, to, to back to your point about the Kane's Arcade and what kids can do if they're given the resources and the time and the space and the encouragement. And of course, not all kids have got that creative. Well, that, that, that's the question in itself, right? Is this, is this in all of us? Is it in some of us? Like, do we do we do we have some obligation to try and encourage it in, in well, all kids or? Well, that that video that, that I mentioned that's on the BBC News site this morning from Feversham School in Bradford. I mean, the the music teacher there says that every child has creative and musical ability in them, and it's for us to develop and nurture that. Um, Ken Robinson's TED talk says that the school systems can teach creativity out of children. A lot of people beat him up. The same lobby say that anybody who criticises the education system is therefore criticising hard-working teachers and therefore should be stopped at all costs. Goodness me, I, th I think you should be able to criticise the system. So, and, and I think, is it Picasso who said that we're, we're all born creative, the challenge is to stay creative and not let it be taught out of us? I, I think you could argue that, I, I would go on record as saying I believe to a certain extent the education system we have does teach creativity out of children. Lots of schools do a great job of resisting that and doing better work. Um, I'd also say that circumstance possibly does that. You know, when you've got when you've got challenged school communities, families juggling two, three jobs, minimum wage, they aren't there for their children. We've all done it. Give your child your smartphone or tablet, it's a great babysitter. But it's like giving a kid a bag of crack and then suddenly expecting them not to crave it the next day, you know. Not that I've done that. But you know, it's it, this, it's, 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 it's very seducing, it's very attractive, it's addictive. And we can't blame these kids for having it one minute and not the next. And so, so my point there, I think, is social <coughs> deprivation and family background denies a lot of kids access to a lot of these experiences. And some schools, in some of the most challenged areas, will run after-school clubs, which they, they dub, they call enrichment, enriching the school day, which in many cases are mandatory. So they have to go to a coding club, they have to go to a music class, they have to do drama or dance. But then when you make, when you make kids do things, it's about the best thing in the world to make them not want to Well, do yeah, it. it is back to this mindset. You know, do I you know. let kids follow the intuition and their passion? And yeah, I th I th I, my belief there is that, that optimises for creativity, giving, giving, giving people the space to follow their own dreams. In fact, a recent guest on the show, the way he runs his company, he talks about the dream incubator where he just has his staff describe their dreams and then the company together comes, uh, comes forward to fulfill on that to the best they can. You know, whether that dream is inside or outside of the work context, which is just extraordinary for me in terms of the, 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 the level of creativity he's unleashing. And that company has got you know, a couple of successful products as well as a, a service in design, um, a digital agency service. So, so that's proof in a sense of what this mindset can allow and the numbers are fine you know in fact they're one of the most profitable agencies of their size in europe that's so, a creative agency yeah that's it, yeah. a creative agency so it's not like there's some compromise um and i and that, that was what was interesting about most likely to succeed was these kids are given free reign to work on these projects their grades were not discernibly different they were about the same as these other schools which try and train them <laughs> to the test and yet those kids who are trained to the test aren't discovering their passions they're not learning leadership skills they're not developing their creativity so it's and what happens to them when they come to the end of this school conveyor belt no more tests no more framework no more teachers telling them where to stand and what to do they're looking off a cliff aren't they really it's called the real world and the rest of their lives right yeah fascinating so you've got some rockets <laughs> with you nick and I thought we might 
blast off a rocket off the back of this boat. Well, yeah, um, it's funny actually. The the, end of the this is all kicked off by um, this book. My my dad, my dad's eighty three, and he volunteers in an Oxfam bookshop, which is a charity bookshop, and and in in the country. And he was rummaging around in a box, and he came across this book one day, Rocket Boys by Homer Hickam. And this is a, this is an incredible story. My my dad said. It's the best book I've ever read, Nick. Have that. And my dad's read lots of, lots of books. And he said, I've emailed the author. He hasn't got back to me yet. I thought, well, good luck with that. So I looked it up, and it's all like millions of copies of this. It's translated into French, Spanish, German, Italian. They're just reprinted in Chinese. And it's about four boys growing up in a, a West Virginian coal mining town in 1957, a little town called Colwood. And there was only one job in Colwood, and that was working in the mine. And Homer Hickam didn't want to be a coal miner. His brother was a great footballer, so he was going to have a, be a professional footballer and escape, and Homer was destined to be a coal miner. One day they saw a spot in the sky, and it was the world's first satellite, the Sputnik. And Homer had an idea. It was an October evening, actually, and the film of this book is called October Sky, which is an anagram of Rocket Boys, O-C-T-O-B-E-R-S-K-Y, which is a bit, whoa. True story. Went home and learned to make rockets. First one crashed into his mum's fence and blew it down. Not, not supposed to laugh, she was quite cross. But she said, if at first you don't succeed... Try and try, try again. again. So he did, he made another one. That crashed into the coal mine where his dad was the boss. So he got clipped round the ear for that, which you were allowed <laughs> to do in those days. So you get social services now. <laughs> and um, his dad says, stop this nonsense with the rockets. Go and do your exams, sit your tests, and then come and work in the mine with me, and I'll, I'm, a, I'm the boss. You'll have to come underground, but I'll... I'll I'll make sure it's not too rough. And I've only been in a coal mine once. I had my thumb chopped off. It's a nightmare. And um, the third rocket they made was a bit better. And then he went to his, head te his teacher and she said, look, here's a book on rockets. Keep trying, crack it. And a year later, those four boys made a rocket that went six miles high in the sky. And he ended up working for NASA and put man on the moon. So Homer's given us permission to his story. I connected with him after a glass of red wine and an evening on Twitter. I have to teach my dad that technique. And, and basically, Homer Hickam's given us his permission to use his story. So we take that into British schools. We do an all-school assembly. We tell them that story. We talk about careers and aspiration and working hard and doing your maths and science, but being creative and making. And we make rockets with the kids, and we fire a dynamite rocket off. And this is one of those rockets. We usually put a few stickers on it. There's a dynamite motor in the bottom of that. And we fire this off. I think, I think what, I've had fantastic feedback from people. I think one of the most fantastic anecdotes was a head teacher of a school just down the road here in Fulham. Um, now, this head teacher was from the Welsh Valleys in South Wales, the coal mining centre of Britain. Industry's been ravaged. The, clo the pits have been closed, very similar to West Virginia. And he tweeted after I'd been into his school with this session. He said, it's the most exciting thing he's ever seen in a school. Should we go and fire this? Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. And, and this, this reminds me of when I saw this happen in the school where I came into dad, there were three kids wet themselves with excitement at the prospect of this, <laughs> which, 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 uh, which ultimately you had to switch to the non-explosive rocket. But yeah. You're sure you're going to be okay? okay. <laughs> you're going to have to contain yourself, are you? Got my nappy on. All right. The Brilliant. good thing about this in theory, the rocket can only go one way and that's up. So this is like fireproof toilet paper, basically. Okay. Which is probably quite handy after a curry. <laughs> so put that on there like that. So in theory, that rocket can, get, can only go up. Right, let's go to the bank. Three, Three two, two, one. Wow, so that was, that was very exciting. You enjoyed that. I music. contained myself. <laughs> there were no accidents. It was, it was awesome, very fast. Well, it's funny because um, the big thing in education around the world now is this thing called STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths, which sounds great. We spell STEM with an A, and, and that's why, because as Seth Godin, uh, who's inspired a lot of our stuff, he, he's got this lovely phrase, art is what we call it when what we do might connect us. And, and that's what art is to us. It's not something that just belongs in galleries on pedestals. Art connects all of us. And today my art is rockets. It might be coding next week, cardboard or whatever. Everybody's got an art. Everybody's got creativity. 
what we have to do is put creativity first and get everybody to collaborate on, on this project, collaborate for creativity. Brilliant, that's a, that's a fantastic message. My last question, something I ask a lot of my guests is, for you, Nick Corston, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human? Wow, I think it means for me, for everybody I work with, for everybody I, in this country, hopefully, I think it, what, me, what it means to be human for me is the ability to express your creativity, um, to have the skills to do so, and the freedoms, and the opportunity. And, and that's what this is about for me, it's allowing people to express their creativity, to power communities, to inspire their kids with creativity. Fantastic. Is that a bit of a waffle? No, I love it. Right. And for people who want to know more about Steam, best place to go? Best be Steam Co. Steam Co, sorry. Yeah. I just... Go on, sorry. Steam Co, best place to go. Best place to go. Steam Co, if people want to find out more, we've got a website, steamco.org.uk, but what we're really doing is putting a call out now for, for creative people and companies to work with us, to, to maybe give up a day or to give up some of the staff or to sponsor us, to come into schools and work with us. You know, I promise them an amazing day. As I can attest to, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Nick, thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Cheers.